let me first talk about the problem. The problem that we're trying to address is energy. Energy is limited on our planet. And no matter what you, you think about renewable energy and fossil fuels, whether you happen to want to party with tea or you want to go ahead and hug some trees, it's actually very limited on our planet. So let me try to address what fossil fuels are. And in order to do that, I have to tell you a little bit about the history of our planet. Our planet is 4.6 billion years old. This is rounded up a little bit. And this is a massive number. It's hard to think about. But I want to use something that everyone is intimately familiar with to explain to you really the magnitude of the, of the history of our planet, the age of our planet. And that is toilet paper. <laughs> All right. And so now imagine you're here, right at the very edge of the toilet paper. And, and the little weird cardboard thing at the center is the beginning of our planet. So about a thousand squares or so of toilet paper exist on this roll, which means each square is about 4.6 million years. Now, if you take that first little part of the toilet paper, the first square, and rip off about a quarter of it, this contains everything that humans have done on our planet. All right, we're essentially a drop in the bucket or just a tiny piece of the toilet paper roll. All right, this goes back to the first use of fire. This goes back to the first use of stone tools, Neanderthals, modern humans, everything, all right? We're just a drop in the bucket. But life existed for much, uh, much earlier on in the history of our planet. Going back to about 70 or 75% of this toilet paper roll, imagine unrolling it. This is as far back as ancient life goes. And it's this ancient life that we drive our cars on, okay? This is where fossil fuels come from. This is why fossil fuels are not sustainable, because ancient life only occurred once on our planet. And the rate at which we use it today, again, imagine that small little piece of toilet paper, everything that humans have done, is, is simply not sustainable. So what we need to talk about instead of fossil fuels, and this is one of our ideas that I'm going to talk to you about today, are living fuels. So how are we going to get there? What I want to convince you of is that microbes may be the key. So I'm, I'm a bacteriologist. We study things that you can't see in the lab unless you use very fancy microscopes. And I'm going to tell you about microbes today that can make electricity and also microbes that we think can use electricity. And this sounds kind of odd, but in reality, electricity is life. The food that we eat is converted into CO2, carbon dioxide, protons and electrons. And those electrons fly down a chain of proteins, pumping protons, and this current that gets generated allows us to make ATP. And ATP is the currency of life, right? This is the energy of life. But in order for this to happen and to keep occurring, electrons have to have somewhere to go. There's our electron running. And for us, electrons go to oxygen. Now, oxygen has been around on our planet for only since about 2.4 billion years ago, right? So even though oxygen is responsible for everything that we see today, um, it hasn't been around for the entire time that the planet has been here. Oxygen's a great electron acceptor. It takes electrons very well. It allows us to make a lot of energy, a lot of ATP, and it actually allowed us to become big organisms. But as I mentioned, ancient life existed on our planet for a long time, and even before oxygen was around. And even today, there are lots of places on our planet where we can find microbes that live without oxygen. And if we go down into the sediments and the subsurface, there's also some, some interesting lakes and seas that don't turn over very often, but we go into places where we can find microbes that are still living, still thriving, but not using oxygen, using something different. And one of the microbes that my lab studies uses rust. So these bacteria take from the food that they're eating, the electrons that they generate from that food, and they breathe rust, just like we breathe oxygen. But I, I don't recommend breathing rust. You, you, you can't do it. So these bacteria have a pathway of moving electrons from inside of the cell all the way to the outside of the cell, where this insoluble substrate that's actually much bigger than they are exists. 
And it's this metabolism, this ability to move electrons from the inside to the outside of the cell that allows us to do some really fun things with these bacteria in the lab, such as growing them on electrodes. So th we do this in collaboration with Daniel Bond's group at the University of Minnesota. Um, they do some really cool things making these bioreactors that are shown here. And what the bacteria do is they'll attach to this little electrode surface, and we use little carbon graphite electrodes, um, and the bacteria basically think that it's rust, and the food that we give it can then be converted into electricity. So here's my one data slide. So that the bacteria attach to the electrode, they eat the food, they take that food into CO2 and protons, and then the electrons end up going to this electrode, and we can generate current over time. Now this is a really cool trick, and it actually allows us to, to learn a lot about how these microbes work. We don't generate very much electricity. I didn't actually put a, uh, a unit on there. Uh, it's, very, it's, a little, it's just a little bit, okay? So we're not gonna ever drive our cars on things that are making electricity, on bacteria making electricity. But we have an idea. Um, but before I get into that idea, I need to tell you about another microbe. All right, so the bacteria I just talked about in the environment do this reaction. They eat their food in the subsurface where there isn't oxygen, and they move electrons to iron. There are also bacteria in the environment that do the opposite reaction. That's shown here. So these, these bacteria take electrons from iron. One of the reasons that we're really interested in these is we think that these bacteria also must use proteins on the outside of their cell, like our electricity-making ones. Because in the process of taking electrons from iron too, they make rust, they make rocks. So where do we find microbes that might do this? And for that, I wanna take you on a little journey through the Sudan underground mine up in northern Minnesota, not too far from Ely. And this is the A-frame that you see um, uh, when you approach the mine. And when you enter in this little cage, and it's, it's certainly not an elevator, it really is more like a cage, you enter this, this very small cramped space and you get to have a nice ride to the bottom. This is what it's like to be in this cage. Back in the day when this mine was actually operated, um, 18 or so miners would get crammed into this little tiny space. And I don't really, I can't even imagine how they did that. There's about six of us in this car at the moment. And when you get to the bottom of the mine, you're greeted with a very interesting sign. We have to get to the bottom first. Yeah. There we are. And this sign tells you how far down underground you are. You're, you're at level 27, almost half a mile underground. And you're surrounded by, in many spots of this mine, a 2.7 billion year old iron formation. Now, I forgot to mention, this iron mine was actually Minnesota's very first iron mine. It has a very interesting historical significance. It was opened in the, in the early 1880s and operated all the way until the, the 1960s. And in this mine, where there's very old iron. And I actually, I have a piece of it here and a slide to show you on the next slide too. So this is a, a piece of this banded iron that the miners were looking for in this mine. And this, this rock is very interesting because it's very old. I mentioned it's 2.7 billion years. This iron predates the oxygenation event of our planet. So 2.4 billion years ago is when oxygen comes on the scene, made by primarily cyanobacteria. They terraform our planet and it actually it leads to us, all right? We can't be here without oxygen. But this rock came out of solution before oxygen was around. And we actually don't really know how. Uh, it's about 300 million years before that event. Now, I was trying to think of a way to get somebody to cry in my talk today, and the only thing I could think of <laughs> was tossing this out into the audience, but <laughs> they told me I would probably get sued, so we won't do that. So this iron oxide, um, we're, we're really interested in this particular environment, mostly because there's tons and tons of iron here. All right, so we're not necessarily interested in these old rocks, even though they're super interesting. We're interested in microbes that might be living here. So in the last days of the mine, before they knew the mine was going to close, they drilled boreholes, they drilled cores down into the mine, and, and miners would look at these rocks coming out of these boreholes to try to decide where they would build level 28, which again, never got built. And what was really interesting, and you can see a remnant here of a piece of, um, 
metal shaft that would have held part of this core is that these boreholes that were several hundred feet down intersected water that was below the mine. And this water is really interesting. It's very unusual. It's about three times saltier than seawater. It has no oxygen in it, so no oxygen gas. And it's got lots and lots of iron too in it. And as it percolates up to the surface, you start seeing lots and lots of things that look like rust, because it's rust, all right? So oxygen is coming in from the, from the, the surface where this, this, mine, this borehole is, is percolating water out and making rust. But there's also microbes that are making rust as well. So let me show you a few other pictures here. This is a picture towards the end of one of the western drifts on level 27. And the researchers looking down intently are looking at a very interesting borehole that we call the far bubbler. We call it the far bubbler because it, it bubbles. So there's a wooden plug that's kind of sitting there that, that the miners had jammed into the hole and the water has still worked its way around it. And these bubbles are methane. We think that the methane that's being produced in this particular environment is a remnant of microbes working and living even further down, some weird microbes called archaea. And as this water percolates up and starts mixing with oxygen, I mentioned that you see lots and lots of rust. This is why it looks so orange. You can see lots of different types of iron formations as well, or different types of minerals that have lots of different colors, from yellow to red to orange and everything in between. There's even some spots that look almost like lava. It's not, it's just some weirder types of iron oxide. And we're really interested in how the microbes that might be mediating some of these um, mineral formations um, could be used for some very interesting biotechnology. Let me show you a couple more pictures from now the east side of level 27 where there's a lot more water. It's a little less salty, but a lot more water. And some of the boreholes, instead of, drilled, instead of being drilled down, were drilled horizontally. And this results in some really interesting formations, such as this one. So this is about a meter tall iron formation. Again, this hole was drilled about 50 years ago and has been spewing water out ever since, very slowly. And you get a whole bunch of this iron oxidation happening, both abiotically and probably also biogenically with, with these microbes as well. So let's get in and, and, and explore um, some of these microbes. Let's take a look at some of them. So we can take samples from the mine, we can bring them back to my lab, we can try to grow things. We can also use microscopy to see what it is that we're looking at. And we have a, a couple of images that were made from isolates that we've been working with in the lab. Here's one of them. We still don't even know what to call this one. It's pretty unusual. Uh, its closest relative is about 92% identical to its 16S gene. And um, this is a huge difference. So we're, we're about, uh, well, it's a huge difference. We're still trying to figure out what these guys are. And here are some other ones. Um, these guys are actually related to microbes that are very commonly found in the ocean. And here's a picture that's an environmental scanning electron micrograph where we can see some of the minerals and we can see some of the microbes too. So the cauliflower looking things and the spiky things are some of these iron oxide minerals that are being made. So what's the idea here? Why did I tell you about microbes making electricity and microbes that seem to be making rocks? Well, we have this idea that we call electrosynthesis. And the idea is that instead of microbes making electricity, we want microbes to use electricity. And by studying the bacteria from the mine that are making rocks, we think we can understand how we can engineer microbes to take electricity in. So here's the, the bacteria I talked about at the beginning that makes electricity. And if we understand these microbes from the mine well enough, we can reverse this. Now, why do we want to do this? We want to do this because we want to use electricity to make these bacteria live. So we can use electricity, we think, to generate the energy currency of the cell, ATP, to generate reducing power. And we can teach them how to fix CO2 just like plants do. And if we can do that, then our bacteria can be used to make fuels. And we would be able to skip the need to take plants. So right now we make biofuels from, from things like corn, soybean. But what we want to do is instead of growing things and then having microbes convert that biomass into something we can drive our car on, we want to try to engineer these bacteria to make fuels for us.
And so that's the big idea. Now, in order to accomplish this, um, we have to have very good colleagues, very good collaborators, and we do. We have to have very good students as well. And we also have to have funding from, to do basic research. And I wanted to acknowledge some of those folks now and thank the TEDx organizers for inviting me to present. Thanks.